Welcome to What's Left, a weekly political discussion challenging the mainstream left. I'm Andy Lipson, and today we have a guest host, Kenny Zapeta, um, uh, who is joining us because Eduardo is in Spain or France. I'm not France. sure of which. Yeah. Um, and we were supposed to have an episode today about uh, interviewing possibly a, a French yellow vest, mm -hmm. um, but Eduardo could not pull that together or he's having some issues over there in France. Um, and um, initially, I had contacted you about maybe doing an episode. Yeah. Um, and we were like, I don't think we have anything to do. Yeah. It's... And then something happened on January 1st. Yeah. Which was? Uh, the U.S. Uh, strike, uh, drone strike uh, killed uh, a top Iranian general, uh, yeah. Qasim, Qasim Soleimani. Sal Sal Soleimani? Soleimani. Soleimani. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying it in Spanish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think it wasn't even a drone. I actually think it was a helicopter strike. Okay. Uh, that's, I, I've heard, it's a I thought it was mm -hmm. a drone strike at first, but I think the U.S. actually... Um, brought an, an airstrike on him directly with, uh, with helicopters, Apache helicopters, and it right. happened in the Iraq Baghdad airport. I mean, I, I, I've seen some of the images of the aftermath and it does seem very precise. It's yeah. not, you know, a, you know, like carpet bombing, it's right. like a very precise uh, strike. Right. And um, so I, I contacted you yesterday and said, let's go ahead and do an episode. Yeah. Um, and Honestly, there's already been people talking about it, and uh, it's a big deal, uh, what's happened. And I, what I said to Kenny was, let's just talk about it on camera. Um, yeah. And now, normally with me and Eduardo, it's sort of, you know, he has a more reformist view, and I'm coming from the vantage point of what I consider like a socialist revolutionary. Here today, we have two people who consider themselves socialists, revolutionaries, so we're not going to really discuss yeah. it from that vantage point, I think, but I did think we, it, this raises a lot of questions for you. It raises some questions for me about what the heck the U.S. is doing yeah. um, and uh, what does this mean? Um, so I figured we'd just talk about it here. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah I mean, they definitely have a lot of questions that are becoming kind of maybe a little clearer. I think that, um, yeah, it's a good, you know, just want to address, raise those questions and see where we go from there. Um, yeah. Um, well, maybe... My first, first question is, what are, what are some of your thoughts about what has just happened? I mean, I was, I was in shock. The first reaction was shock. Actually, a, a co-worker uh, texted me the, the link to the AP Press uh, yeah. uh, first, uh, within the fift, first 15 minutes of being reported. I immediately was, whoa, that's uh, very ballsy, you know, mm -hmm. to pull something like that. Because, uh, I, mean, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know the structure of power in Iran, but hearing that you know this is a top commander yeah. of the uh, irani um, military yeah. uh, can definitely throw you know a wrench into whatever right it's happening he was he was the head of the kuds the Ra revolution Ra iranian revolutionary guard kuds forces yeah. which are responsible which I, as i understand it are paramilitary groups um i do think they operate within iran but also he is responsible for overseeing iranian paramilitary forces in Iraq, yeah. uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, um, and, and within the, um, and forces within Syria as well. Yeah. And, and my understanding too is that that group uh, was placed in the terrorist watch list uh, last year actually. The thing yes, covered, yeah. yes. It's, but it's also the group that, I mean, there, there's a lot of, this is, there's a lot of inter-imperial mess here because yeah. it's also the group that was that allied itself with the United States in going after ISIS, mm -hmm. and actually it was it was Qasim's forces or Soleimani's forces, Iranian forces here were considered fundamental in basically the U.S. Uh, uh, getting back control of what they said ISIS's control of Iraq and Syria, like northern Syria, or yes, okay. uh, all, all of Syria, yeah. um, and. Um, I mean, maybe mostly Iraq, but also within, within Syria, where they had made much headway. And uh, Soleimani has been allied with the U United States around going after the Taliban during the war in Afghanistan. Um, and he was also a general in the a war between Iran and Iraq uh, back in the, in the 80s. Uh, and now in that war, the United States had played the role of basically pitting two of them against each other. They had just, had, they had just lost power in the 70s. Um, 
and so they were trying to use Iraq uh, as a and get Iraq to go after Iran in, in a war that killed at least a million people. It's it's it's, it's speculated, um, and the U.S. basically um, sided mostly with Iraq, okay. but wanted the war to to drain Iran um, and as punishment for the revolution that they had in taking down the Shah. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the questions that came up right away, and I guess this is part of being kind of, I guess, socialist, mm -hmm. uh, revolutionaries, of asking, you know, not taking the news at face value. Um, obviously, our, the U.S. media will fall in line behind the war machine, and so, I, you know, I started questioning what is really happening behind this. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that confuses me uh, is that, you know, this whole um, somewhat, you know, the divide of the ruling class in the U.S., the wrestling of, you know, the proxy war against Russia, proxy war against China. Yeah. And so this to me, at least on the surface, it seems to kind of maybe go uh, not fall in line with that right away. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts, no, because here is, you know, a Republican president, right? Like that tried to pull out, at least uh, symbolically, right. from um, the region, right? Mm -hmm. uh, from uh, northern Syria, and you know he received a lot of blowback from that. Right. You know from Demo Democrats who basically were championing the U.S. as the police of the world. Right. And, and they were also criticizing him for even talking about partially pulling out of Afghanistan, yeah. trying to reach a deal with the Taliban, things like that. Yeah. So again, on the surface, this seems like an escalation um, that can potentially uh, unravel a lot of things. I mean, um, uh, yeah, we can address whether, you know, we expect something from the Iranian mm -hmm. government. But uh, I don't know. I don't know if you have any thoughts in terms of if this is in line or wh what are your thoughts? Why, why is this happening? Yeah, I do think that's the big question. Um, I mean, or one of the big questions for me. Um, and first off, um, I guess what I would say is, Prior to prior to this, tr there had been a lot of criticism for Trump of Trump for supposedly weakening the United States by pulling out it, and uh, the establishment, and I I believe the establishment was using things like the Mueller probe, Russia Gate, and impeachment to force Trump's hand into taking a, a firmer line with Russia. Uh, they were accusing him of being a Putin ally, accusing him of undermining the Ukrainian um, government which they were using as a proxy to fight the Russians. Um, and I had seen Trump as largely pivoting away from Russia mm -hmm. um, and, move, and look, moving more towards war with China or conflict with China. Um, and this, this act is definitely an escalation in my mind, yeah. definitely an escalation, but it's an escalation in the direction, not just of the US and the Middle East, but the US taking on Russia um, because Iran is a major ally of Russia. Um, and a, a major ally of, their, of, of, their, of helping Russia push its interests in that region. Mm -hmm. So to me, this runs directly counter to some of the things that Trump is doing. So it is confusing. Um, and the way I've been looking at it is I do think uh, it, shows, it shows that uh, Ukraine gate and Russia gate have actually been successful at... Um, so he, one of the questions I posed to my partner was who, who did this? Was this Trump? Or was this the establishment? No. Who was behind this attack? Um, and it is dangerous. And it does, it just, I think you use the word shock. I think we haven't seen as big an, a big an event since the day of shock and awe that True. U.S. when U.S. attacked Iraq in 2003. Uh, great that you bring that up because honestly, that is where my mind went to. I mean, I was a, I was a high school student, freshman in high school. And you brought me back to that moment, yeah. you know, when we started seeing the bombings on TV and, you know, and this tension, you know, uh, it's uh, among my coworkers, the young ones that are in college, jo they joke around getting drafted, and you know, and yeah. so this brings up, yeah, th that time of shock and awe. And I think it was intended to do that. I do think um, the U.S. So my answer to this is that this is the establishment behind mm -hmm. this, and but it is the establishment that is endor the, in a sense, fusing itself with what I think. The tr Trump represents, which is moving away from multilateralism yeah. and yeah. moving more towards the U.S. goes it alone, um, and the 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 breakup of the multilateral world, 
um, mm -hmm. which is always a myth under capitalism anyway, because it's yeah. not a multilateral world. It's a, it's a, it's a group of nations in, in competition with one another, but that myth is being exploded, um, and countries, and, they get, and every time it gets exploded, it leads to global war, yeah. um, world wars. Um, and this is the period, I, this is where I think these, these things are headed. So I do think that Trump has convinced the establishment that the U.S. must go it the, with the go it alone, screw NATO. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, I do see that the establishment has gotten Trump to not pivot away from Russia, to not pivot out of the Middle East, because I personally can't see this move draws the U.S. more into the Middle East, not less. Yeah, the no, that is, I definitely agree with that. And uh, I mean, even when I think about the approach to China, it hasn't been a military approach. It's been like an economic, yeah. you know, trade war and this and that. And, and <clears throat> the powers that the U.S. Is, the U.S. is going to rely on Germany here. The U.S. isn't going to rely on mm -hmm. France to, to carry water for this. They're going to rely on Saudi Arabia and yeah. Israel, which are the two powers that, that, are, that they did Check in with about, yeah. hey, we're about to do this. Believe it or not, I heard that they even checked in with the Iraqi government prior to this, and their Iraqi government was like, don't do this, you know? Mm. Um, and they went ahead and did it. Um, because the question for me, though, is, is this the U.S. essentially lighting a match in the Middle East and then still leaving? You know, like, all right, peace out, and throwing a match into the oil, you know, behind them as they leave and let Russia and NATO and them deal with the burn that mm -hmm. comes, takes place? Or is this the U.S.? producing a strategy that it plans on using to continue to control the Middle East. So, I mean, yeah, that, that to me is a possibility because uh, the way I see uh, throwing light in a match and just yeah. letting it blow up because um, the way I see Iran in the context of world politics, it, you know, it comes back to oil uh, to a degree. Because, I mean, we, we in previous episodes, we talked about how uh, it is convenient for the U.S. to destabilize uh, Iran and Venezuela, you know, to make sure that the oil prices stay uh, balanced. Mm -hmm. and because again, if these two countries, Venezuela and Iran, uh, Venezuela being the top uh, oil reserves, proven reserves in the world, mm -hmm. Iran being in the top five, if these two countries produce at max capacity, the oil prices tank. Yeah. And so it's to the benefit of um, Saudi Arabia and the US, uh, the US being the biggest oil producer in the world, to destabilize that region and just say, fuck it, you know, just yeah. uh, let them fight it out. It, they're not going to be able to produce and get their oil in the market. Right. The, the countries <clears throat> that rely on Middle Eastern oil are not the United States. Yeah. It's, it is um, China and Europe. Yeah. So if, so I think there is some reason to believe that the U.S. is based, it might be that, which is, you know, lighting a match and saying, we're out, you know, and we're going to, we're going to let this, we're going to basically make sure this place is, the house begins to burn before yeah. we leave. Um, I could see that because the U.S. is going to have. I mean, there already is calls within the Iraqi government yeah. for them to to leave their embassy. And I mean, that leads me to question whether you know maybe it's not evident now, but whether their focus will again be on Venezuela, being so close. You know, if you know as a possible reserve, you know, of uh, being you know so close by geographically. Yes. Well. I will say that I, I just think a lot of people have said, "Oh, the United States has made a mistake here." Mm -hmm. That the United States has has like, or that Trump has gone crazy, uh, or the U.S. state has gone crazy. That thing, I don't, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. I do think there is no. something important that the U.S. has done here, which is the U.S. had to tolerate their drone being shot out of the mm -hmm. sky by Iran without a response. Um, remember, the US, Trump was about to attack, and they, and they didn't. Mm -hmm. There have been tankers supposedly either sunk or almost sunk in that region that they're blaming on Shia forces aligned with Iran. There have been, uh, in Saudi Arabia, there were uh, attacks on oil refineries, supposedly coming from Yemen forces that were, they said, uh, originated from Iran. They wanted to tie it to Iran desperately. Yes. I mean... Yeah. Uh, well, I think maybe, but yeah. what the, the fact is, is that all these acts happen without the United States responding. Mm -hmm. And I think the United States... The, the United States is basically is trying to shock the world, is trying to say, we'll do anything. We can get anyone anywhere. We're willing, and we're willing to take out high targets. They want to call this guy a terrorist um, uh, because, I mean, the, the claim is that he's trained forces that have been responsible for killing U.S. occupying forces in, in the, throughout Iraq. Yeah. 
Now, it's interesting that they're using that. In the past, they've always said terrorists as non-state actors, mm -hmm. right? P people who are not aligned yeah. with a particular state. Now they're talking about terrorists who are, this is a guy not, is a state actor. He's in Iran, in Iran. Of course, they have Iran being the axis of evil. But what this is, is the U.S. basically saying, we can touch anyone and not just touch anyone in among Hezbollah or Hamas mm -hmm. or uh, some, you know, Osama bin Laden somewhere in a cave. We are willing to hit high-level targets um, and that's a, that's a message I think they want to send to Kim Jong-un. Yeah. That's a message they want to send to China, the, to Russia, that the U.S. is willing to do that. Because China has condemned this, Russia has condemned this, but the U.S. is basically I speak, saying, we're willing to do it. And I think Trump is a convenient person mm -hmm. uh, if the, if, for the U.S. state to exercise a, a, a sort of uh, both a new control mm -hmm. and establish their uh, dominance again uh, militarily and to sort of get things back on back on track for themselves um, because I, this is what I think they're trying to do which is essentially frighten the rest of the world into doing what you're told yeah and um, I mean, it is it seems like a game changer for, uh, to you know a degree like you said it's uh, a bold bolder action or direct, direct action to you know, uh, enemies at the top and that, yeah. you know, the proxies or the, mm -hmm. you know, the rogue agents, you know, militias and stuff. Yeah. And I think you can see the success of it by the three day, like what Iran said is they were going to do a three day, they're going to do three days of mourning. But look, these are, all these countries are crooks. All these yeah. countries are gangsters. Mm -hmm. One of their major players in their gang just got knocked yeah. out by the big gangster. And so the three day mourning is not three day mourning. It's basically, Perfect. Iran is basically going, oh, what the F just happened, sure, yeah. and now they have to figure out how they're going to respond. There will be a response, and, and the, the, the fact is, is this is not just going to be a response from Iran. There will have to be a response from North Korea. Mm -hmm. There will have to be a response from Russia. There will have to be a response from China. Yeah. And, and what we have to understand is that the U.S., in surprising the world, and surprising all of us, is, is reminding us that this is going to be another decade of surprises. Yeah. Because... The reason they're doing that is to try to shock their enemies into being cowed. Mm -hmm. And their enemies, being these other states, uh, and I will conclude Germany, <laughs> France, Britain, Russia. I mean, this is the situation. This is how capitalism is constructed. All these people, all these countries are enemies. And they're all competing to, mm -hmm. to who's going to see the biggest slice of the pie and keep it and yeah. grow that pie. And if you're not growing that pie, you're losing your, your pie. And the U.S. is just willing to shock and awe anyone in order to preserve their power. Um, and they don't know where this is gonna lead. They don't know what the response I Iran will have. They don't know the response Russia will have, but they're basically banking on their response not being as brutal and as risky yeah. and as dangerous as theirs. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that uh, people ask me, you know, they reached out to kind of figure out what was going on and uh, I was uh, as confused as many other people and uh, but the one thing I first thought is like, I don't think conventional war is gonna follow from this. Uh, I mean, I see that, I mean, the nature of war has changed. You know, it happened under Obama, mm -hmm. you know, through drone strikes, remote, you know, proxy. That's always been the case, proxy yeah. war, but you know, te more technological, you know, bombard, uh, bombing people from Colorado, you know, and mm -hmm. so, I don't, I don't know. I don't see a scenario where the U.S. will invade because people were wondering, are we going to invade Iran? That's what some people ask me, and I'm like, yeah. I don't think so, no. because that would be a great uh, strategic mistake. I've heard in the past that you know Iran is a complete different beast. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, there is they're more homogeneous. You know, there they, there is not as much sectarian div divisions that can be exploited mm -hmm. as you know as it happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, you know, the terrain is super difficult, a lot of mountains. Uh, they are also 80 million people. They're not a small population by any means. And so, you know, that, my first reaction was, I don't think we're going to see the kind of war that, uh, you know, we saw in Afghanistan and Iraq. But definitely my question is, what kind of response is going to come from this? And hearing you, it, it, it makes sense, you know, uh, when you use the metaphor of... of gangsters right and you know if you're under attack you're gonna get weapons you're mm -hmm. gonna you know mm -hmm. you know get ready for battle mm -hmm. you might not be the aggressor you know uh and the u.s is the biggest bully here mm -hmm. but you will get ready and so this, this will this will escalate you know yes. uh, uh, things around the world yes. uh, because like you said 
uh, this is a message for you know people that are uh, stand up to the U.S. Right. And, and the only response that you can have if you're also a capitalist power, which Russia is a capitalist power, China is a capitalist power, Iran is a capitalist power of lower stature, if not of that weight, but within yeah. that in that region, the only response you can have is you either accept being cowed, yeah, that is you def you accept defeat, or you come back with a response that was equally surprising and shocking. And that is where this leads. Um, so, because I do agree that this doesn't immediately mean U.S. troops. There, are, there have been talks of 4,000 troops being put on reserve for sending to the Middle East. I don't know what the play is for the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they actually, I mean, I've heard, like I said, I've heard that Iraq is talking about, you got to empty out your embassy and get them out, uh, which was also something that happened just before. That was another embarrassment for, for the United States, which was their embassy was attacked this week. Yeah. Um, and um, again, they were, they were blaming that on um, Sol Soleimani and Iran. Um, but what this does mean is there has to be, the rest of the other powers aren't going to give up. They aren't going to just accept. They're, they're going to recover. They're, 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 they're going to themselves decide, okay, what is our move here? Mm -hmm. What is our move to make us the winners in this game um, yeah. of maximizing profits, of maximizing resources? And that's the game that's being played. Um, and in order to do that, they have to have their own surprises in store. Surprises for us, mm -hmm. surprises for us, the working class, surprises for the United States, surprises for China, surprises for Russia. Um, maybe this means you, the Russia does something in the Crimea that, that weakens, that, that destabilizes the Ukrainian government. You know? mm -hmm. what, but they have to take an act. And this is why it's like some people are talking about this guy being killed as like the Archduke Ferdinand when yeah. he was assassinated. These are the sorts of moves that I do believe indicate how quickly and how readily things can move from local war, regional war, uh, an act of surgical strike to you, you, you don't have a choice any longer. Mm -hmm. um, and the last sets of, there have been defense documents that I, I, I can't remember which website I saw, where there is acceptance among the US ruling class that the po there's the possibility of using tactical nuclear weapons without losing everything, mm -hmm. you know? And that, the same discussion's happening in China, the same yeah. discuss discussion's happening in Russia, and so those are the people who are ruling the world right now. Mm -hmm. They are people who, who can't afford to lose and who are willing to risk every, everything and anything to make sure that they win. And that's, what the, you, that's what's been exposed here. Not Trump's madness, mm -hmm. not, the, um, not the fact that Trump doesn't know what he's doing or the US state doesn't know what he's doing. Like I said, I believe this is an establishment move. I believe the establishment has gotten, has taken a piece of what Trump is trying to offer, but largely brought him in the game of, of more global wars, of more, mm -hmm. uh, of more regional wars. Um, and you're the guy who's gonna help us Put our get our enemies in line, um, and better than any Democrat right now, yeah. because I believe the establishment were, was hoping for Clinton in 2016, and I don't think there. I think and, the establishment has moved away from the Democrats. And let us remember that she said, you know, that she would bomb Iraq to yeah. pieces. Yes, you know. I in fact, the one of the top Democrat um, people on the I can't remember what his name is, but he's a leading Democrat, uh, one of the defense councils or something like that. After the, the embassy got attacked, he was basically saying, we look weak, Trump doesn't have any response. Right now or Benghazi? Uh, uh, no, after the, okay. the embassy in Iraq getting mm -hmm. attacked. He was criticizing Trump for making the yeah. US look so weak. And then Trump does this and he's like, oh my God, what did you just do? Yeah. You know, and I do, uh, this is not Trump just being on an all night bender and suddenly deciding something. Yeah. I've also I mean, heard, go ahead. Sorry, and th th that's, when I was reading the response of the Democratic candidates and like Ocasio Cortez and stuff, and uh, you know their response, if I summarize it, is you know good but right you know like you know this guy was an evil person, this guy was you know a terrorist, but he, basically they want to paint him as a rogue actor, right. painting Trump as a yes. rogue actor, you know that he doesn't have control. That he's, you know, he didn't ask permission uh, from Congress as if, you know. <laughs> yes. And that, well, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no please. Um, and that's no longer necessary because of the, what is it, the authorization of the use of military forces that was, off, that was started in 2001. Basically says anytime you call, some, if you consider somebody a terrorist threat, the president does not need yeah. to go to an act of Congress for war. And there, this, the, uh, author, the authorization, 
for the use of military forces was up for renewal again this time, and the Democrats p passed it overwhelmingly again. Yeah, so very they, arbitrary use right, of force. Yeah. They they know that the, Trump doesn't need to do this, and they don't. They're certainly not going to tie their own hands when they're when they have their president up there. If they get, they're not going to tie their hands with the, no. needing to get an act of Congress because I do think that the U.S. Ironically, uh, the the defense defense um, uh, the defense plans that the that the that came out with Mad Dog Mattis and Trump when mm -hmm. in 2017 when they they put forward their proposal for for keeping U.S. strong I can't remember what it was called really urged about pivoting away from war on terror and moving more towards a larger preparing for larger wars with China mm -hmm. and Russia and it, and a defense and a military defense that was capable of doing that which is partly why the there they were asking for the largest military budget ever this year. Yeah. Um, so I do believe that they're, that the U.S. is moving away from war on terror, mm -hmm. but clearly they're going to use that language of terror of to then draw in the crosshairs bigger powers that are aligned with Russia and China and let them know that they're next. Um, and they're next in terms of we're going to undermine your place in the world uh, at your expense so that we can reap the benefits of the resources we need, of the markets we need, we're going to make sure that you are not strong enough to advance your causes. We're going to make sure that your proxies are weak, and if you come after our proxies, we're taking you down. Um, which is why I do think um, the U.S. is. I mean, that's what I think it means to go alone. Which is we're going to use our relationship with Saudi Arabia and, and Israel. The United States is going to mm -hmm. use their relationship with Saudi Arabia and Israel to advance their cause in the Middle East. I think it's about Mexico and Colombia. Um, in the, in South America, um, and Britain is the closest thing they have to an ally in the United, in, in European Union. Uh, Britain was critical of this, but you know I think the U.S. is going to basically uh, go it alone. Um, and the 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 folks that think that there's some sort of multilateral collab collaboration of, of community of countries that can rein the United States in and bring that bring them back to you know like. Uh, sanity that's that's a myth because yeah. that that community doesn't exist it's a it's a it's a band of hostile brothers um and the only way of taking the only way of ending this is is socialist revolution um and there is no solution through through russia through china through the united states through iran none of these powers are, are going to make the world a safer place mm -hmm. um the only way it's going to be done is the is the Working class, basically, uh, making a revolution. Uh, this country or their countries, and and all those countries yeah. are going to have to take down all their governments. Because I mean, this is something you said in the past, and that I think it's important that uh, you know our own enemy here is our capitalist states. Mm -hmm. The Russians have their own enemy in their Russian capitalist state. Venezuelans have their own enemy in their you know the capitalist state, and you know. Yeah, and so our work is to conquer political power, mm -hmm. working class democracy, and decision making. Yeah, we're far away from that. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the things I've heard from the left um, that has been critical of this um, has been thinking that this is Israel or Saudi okay. Arabia uh, okay. getting the United States to do this. Oh, what do you make of that? I haven't heard those things uh, in the bit that I've read and stuff. I because they, they're saying that Netanyahu is, yeah, is uh, lobbying or influencing. Yeah, and is, and is risking not being reelected mm -hmm. and that this event actually plays for his reelection. And sort of the idea here that, that people who I've read and who I have respected, I do respect, mm -hmm. the, uh, this is people in the gray zone and things like this. Um, the, uh, this guy, Max Blum, Blumenthal, Blumenthal mm -hmm. um, basically saying that Israel is... Israel is basically controlling the United States in this region and getting them to do their bidding because he's basically saying Trump, this doesn't help the United States, um, and it only helps, it mostly helps Israel. Okay. Um, and I think, I personally think they've got it backwards. Yeah. That there's no way Israel wags, the, the tail of Israel wags the U.S. dog. Mm. Um, that the, U, the U.S. is the dominant power in the globe, um, and Israel knows that, and Israel is counting on using its relationship with them to maintain their their usefulness and their military presence as a colonial settler state in that region, um, as an apartheid state. Um, and now they've got, they've got an even tighter alliance now with the United States by virtue of 
this sort of go-it-alone strategy that the Trump is doing, and I think the establishment of the U.S. state is endorsing um, in, in taking this action up. Um, because, like you said, while there is criticism of, like, hey, you didn't consult us, are you sure you want to do this? Overall, there's an overall yeah. agreement that something that had should, to be done. Yeah. I mean, that it was a good thing that it was done. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, there is no, you know, this shouldn't have, this should, this should have never happened, right. you know. Right. Uh, this it's, should maybe happen differently, but. Correct. You know, and this is a bad guy, but, you know. Right. Right. But he's a rogue. Again, they bring it back to, I think, the political cycle. Right. Uh, you know, the Democratic candidates, at least. Uh, you know, they all at least fall in line with that whole idea of making Trump seem out of control. Yeah. And as if he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I do think, like some people have also said that this is um, Trump trying to distract from the impeachment. I've heard that argument, yeah. What do you think of that? I'm not sure. I actually wanted to ask you that. I, I, I mean, it definitely is the biggest news. It, it's caught people's attention more than the impeachment. Yeah. Like, you know, a lot of people have, that don't usually engage in politics. This definitely, like, steered something in them, uh, in friends, you know, family, whatever, uh, that, you know, they all roll their eyes when, it, you know, talk of impeachment comes up, you know, but this catches their attention for sure. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. What do you think? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think is the main, you know, you wouldn't take such a bold step to, you know, just to win an election. Yeah. I mean, I do think uh, that war tends to help, you know, get reelected, especially if your country is perceived under threat. Yeah. But I, I think the U.S. here is, you know, is obviously the aggressor. It's, oh, it always is, but, um, you know, I don't think... So my, my, my concern is for the future, after this happened, it's any other possible acts of violence being blamed on Iran, you know, for a possible excuse, sure. you yeah. know, and to es escalate even more. Yes. So, but I mean, uh, that's why I bring up the fact that I, I, I don't think the U.S. would want to go into Iran, but uh, definitely, I don't know. I don't well, see uh, first, uh, the dude, the defense, the, the new defense who replaced Mad Dog Mattis, his last name is Espy, I don't know his first name, maybe it's Nathaniel. He basically said, yeah, we know that Iran's going to respond, but they're going to regret anything they do. Yeah. Like, he's basic. I mean, and this is like, this is the language of Pompeo. This is the language of Espy. This is not just Trump. I mean, these are, yeah. these are deep state people talking, you know. So clearly a part of the establishment has, has digested what has been done and puts the stamp of approval mm -hmm. and authorized it. And in fact, you know, possibly came to the Trump and said, we, we can act now, let's do it. Um, because we have, to, we can no longer be the, the embarrassment to, as the global empire mm -hmm. that's being embarrassed around the globe by, by Iran. Um, and that makes us, that makes the United States look weak. And they're mm -hmm. right, you can't do that. If you this game, you cannot be perceived as weak. That's how capitalism makes it. Um, now, in terms of, is this, so, so, I don't believe, well, I do believe it is related to the impeachment mm -hmm. in, this, in this way. Because I used to think of the, I thought the Ukraine stuff was all about the elections. Like, it was just electioneering, mm -hmm. just trying to, who's going to win the election. But I, I have come to see or believe that there really is a policy difference around challenging Russia. Yeah. Um, and, and this act does challenge Russia. This act is exactly in line with the, the people who are authors of Ukraine Gate and using trying to impeach Trump on the basis of him being a a, mm -hmm. uh, a a Manchurian candidate for Putin or for him trying to weaken Ukraine. This is a this is basically exactly what they wanted. Um, now they're saying they don't want it, but this is what they've been pushing for in trying to impeach this guy. And I think the impeachment has been effective. I think impeachment has corralled him into saying I've got to play a little bit of ball here because okay. I actually think in terms of elect getting Trump getting elected. He was, the, the popularity of the impeachment was really low. Like yeah. there was a, a spike for it and then it, people were just saying, yeah. this is bullshit. And so Trump could have, in many ways, people could have said Trump could have won the election and then done this thing after he, after he wins the election. Because yeah. I think it was a slam dunk. I actually think Trump has put his election at risk by doing this, but he's done it because I think there are, there are, bigger, there are bigger powers within the state who are saying we have to take this move. And they've, They've basically got him. How does he put his uh, um, ele election at risk? Because the one thing, 
the one part of his base, there's a part of his base that really f felt like he was the anti-war candidate. Mm -hmm. That who was angry about Syria, angry when he did that, but has all, but, and were supported him when he went, we're gonna do, half, we're gonna do a half pull out of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We're doing a full pull out of Syria. They were like, yes, this is, what we, this is what we wanted, things like this. So I think he has risked an element of his base mm -hmm. among, among workers or people who support him. Now, ironically, I've been checking some of these people who on the right, who have been critical of him in the past, just to see where, mm -hmm. where are they landing on this thing. And honestly, Tucker Carlson, mm -hmm. Tucker Carlson was critical of this, but didn't want to say Trump's name. Didn't want to say, uh, you know, like he was saying, look what the state has done. This is wrong. Look what we've, the U.S. state has done. They've just made war more likely. Mm -hmm. But he's, there, he's trying to act like Trump didn't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and other people who were critical of what he did in Syria are basically saying, yeah, he should do this. Has he even spoken to me about this? Tucker Carlson? No, uh, Trump. I wonder. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Trump is, he basically came out and said, I'm not trying to make more war, I'm trying to end war mm -hmm. by basically, you know, getting rid of a, a criminal like this, giving it with a person who is trying to make war on U.S. Um, soldiers, uh, not, not saying that these soldiers are actually right on the border of Iran, not saying that these soldiers are occupying countries uh, that they shouldn't be in, um, but basically saying he is threatening U.S. soldiers abroad or anywhere. Um, so that's where his accusation of this guy being a terrorist is. So um, it's in line with the language around ISIS, with the language around the war on terror, yeah. with the language around Osama bin Laden, uh, and now they're, used, now they're using terror language to go after, directly after states. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know. So going back to his uh, re-election, you were saying that you know, half, there's some of, a part of his base that looked at him as a weak uh, you know, representative in terms of taking the war, right, to the world, or? Um, who, no, who basically saw, I mean, Trump in the past has tweeted things critical of Obama mm -hmm. for um, being in Iraq. He, Trump said he never would be, he would have never gone to Iraq. He was saying we, should, we have to get out. And there are people who thought he was the president to get us out of these regions mm -hmm. and to stop endless war and to stop regime change. Okay. Yeah. And clearly he's not. Yeah. You know, and, and the, <laughs> for me, the silver lining here is that I've had problems with what I, is, which is what I think the left has been on principle mm -hmm. about this stuff. Supporting Obama or, you know, um, calling, uh, painting, painting, um, you know, uh, non-socialists in socialist colors to, to, to provide, you know, for whatever reason. Um, and what I, what I see on the right is an equally unprincipled right. Um, mm -hmm. That is, that I think a lot of these people who are on the right who are screaming about Syria but aren't now upset about this are worried about Trump losing in, in November. So they don't want to say anything. Yeah. Um, and so instead they're supporting Trump on it. And so the fact that the right wing is as unprincipled as the left wing, to me, is, I take some solace in that, um, in that none of, these, none of these sides are going to have anything principled or even anything strong that they can offer the working class. Um, so, you know, that's just my kind of pet project thinking. Um, when I think about these things. So it's just a side thought that I have, you know, which is yeah. that the right is as effed up as the left is. Um, yeah. And that's a good thing because uh, I, I, I think because the, the, the right has been rising all around the world um, and um, there is no real international principle. There is no real principle of peace that exists within the right because it's all nationalist. But Unfortunately, the left has had nothing to offer people and has only offered people lives. And so um, I think now you s we see that the right wing is also offering only lies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's a good thing for those of us who want to build the left. Uh, yeah. I mean, at least in this country, right? The, the right in this country. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, is that it, maybe? Maybe. Any other thoughts? Any, well, any other thoughts from you about this? I don't know. I mean, what do you expect Iran? What do you see as a part, you know, this playing out? Uh, how would they respond? You know, I mean, I know it's a big question, but... Uh, I mean, I, what, 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 these, what these forces will do immediately, I don't know. Um, no. I do believe that, to me, what this shows is, again, that the, the immediate... The, it's unfortunate Eduardo's not here because mm -hmm. in our COP25 COP episode, mm -hmm. he was like, Andy, why do you always bring it back to U.S. imperialism? Why do you yeah. always talk about the war? 
you know, we're talking here about the environment. And events like this uh, remind, remind, I think should be a reminder of why, like, the environment is being destroyed by capitalism. Yeah. Um, and it's a faster process at times, slower process at other times. But the speed with which the world could be destroyed so that humans really can't live on it can happen in weeks. Yeah. That's what this event shows to me. Because the one thing I can say is that unless these people, these criminals who run this system, are stopped, they, they are going to have a world war. Mm -hmm. um, it, the next thing isn't U, U.S. invading Iran, but this will eventually lead to some sort of escalation from some other actor that the U.S. will have to respond to if it feels it's threatened. And we have to understand there's nothing they're not willing to do. The only thing they're not willing... The only thing stop, there's nothing stopping them except to say that they need to do something that will terrify their opponent into believing you should not, you could, you, there's not, this is a line you can't cross. And I don't think, there's no line for them. There's no line for the United States. No. There's no line for China. There's no line for Russia. There's no line for Britain. There's no line for Germany. There's no line for any capitalist because their only thing they have to be dedicated to is, is profits and their continued growth as a, as a national power yeah. that, to, to preserve and expand on those profits. And if the U.S. is getting over on them, then they have to take some sort of step to, to counter that. Um, so where they act to do that, I can't know. Um, because I don't know how all the different parts, of the, the different powers have their fingers in different pies. Mm -hmm. I know the U.S. is everywhere, you know. Um, and so what, what people, what countries that are directly in competition with the U.S. will do to respond now? Not sure, but I know they have to respond. Um, and they have to respond in a way that um, puts fear into the United States. And if they put fear in the United States, then we have to know that the United States will respond in a way that then goes back and puts fear in their opponent. Escalation. Escalation. There's no, there is no alternative to that. I mean, that's one of the aspects of, like, weapons, right? Nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, why Iran and North Korea are pursuing some of this stuff, because if you're under a constant attack, right. you know, you have to have something big enough to scare people away. Right. You know, a big which, hammer. Which is why the only solution to this, there's no solution other than social, international socialist revolution, a working class dictatorship internationally. Um, and the only way to get there is through strikes and general strikes and then work, yeah. workers councils set up uh, across countries and then ultimately um, uniting in a common cause of worker solidarity to run the globe. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, right now the response, uh, we'll see protests, you know, anti-war pro protests and I don't know, if, you know, you know, uh, obviously I, I don't believe that is does anything really. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if we were to go plan strikes, you know, in order for our government to stop doing this shit, you know, to get him out of power, uh, because we don't—they're not doing our bidding; they're doing their own bidding. Right. You know. Well, uh, here's the thing: on December, what's today? December. To January fourth. January. Yeah, it's December. Two January third or fourth. Fourth, twenty twenty. On the <laughs> tomorrow is the fifth, and on the sixth we have our first day of school. Yeah. We're gonna go to work. And our union is going to go to work. Teachers will go to work. Teachers will go to work across the country. And the only way we could send a message to really stop and maybe get the United States to rethink this is if we didn't. Yeah. And that's it. Like it, the, the idea that we're something. There's a demonstration on Saturday that would happen that's going to make a difference. Now we've already we had the million you person march in, in Iraq and yeah. stuff like that. And those are fine in terms of sentiment, but. First of all, sentiment has been etched away by Obama and the Democratic Party, and I think now people have, people who, people who, one of the complaints people are making about bombing Iran is like, hey, wait, they were our ally in fighting ISIS. So what, once you say that, then you've already bought into the U.S. war. Once you've said, hey, wait a second, you just got our ally. You just got our ally against ISIS. Well, that's, a, that's not a good thing. Then you already bought into the whole war on terror. So when you have a left wing that's saying shit like that, mm -hmm. you don't have a left wing that can be anti-imperialist because they've already bought into the war on terror. That's the language of the war on terror. Yeah. So um, this, the, the U.S. anti-war movement is almost non-existent. 
There will be a demonstration, so there might be demonstrations, sizable demonstrations throughout the city, mm -hmm. but they offer no challenge yeah. to, to what the U.S. is doing. Um, and even the millions and millions of people who came in this country back in the war in Iraq and the ones that were, that were internationally couldn't, could not offer a challenge. The only way we're going to stop this is stopping capitalism and, f and putting fear into the capitalists about them sec second guessing themselves not just the fear that the, the U.S. capitalists shouldn't just have fear of Russian capitalists. They won't really stop this or won't really be put on notice until they fear the U.S. working class. Yeah, I mean, the, the, when we're talking about weapons in response, I mean, that is our ultimate weapon, right? As working class, uh, the ability to strike and bring... Production to a halt. Yeah, to a halt, yeah. And, I mean, you, again, you can wave... Uh, uh, you know, in beg basically. That's how I see protests begging. Yeah. You know, the ruling class to change their mind. Um, but uh, I mean, I do. Maybe we'll jump in a slightly different question about being a socialist. You yeah. know, uh, so say we have a socialist revolution in this country. Yeah. Um, then we have to fight, you know, these other powers, right? Yeah. You know, this is something that comes up. You know, I, I hear this uh, anxiety from people that, you know, have questions about socialism. So if it's not us, then someone else will do it. What would you say to that? I'm not sure. So mm -hmm. if it's not us ruling the world, you know, there are, you know, China's knocking at the door, you know, applying for being in the empire, yes. Yes. Russia being, applying for the same job. So if it's not if we are distracted, or at least this is how I perceive it. You know, some people say uh, we are. F so aren't they a threat to our revolution? Yes, uh, the Chinese capitalists, the Russian capitalists would then they would be in this bind. They would they would have the benefit of seeing the U.S. empire crumble literally, mm -hmm. and then they would see that as an opportunity, no question. Um, at the same time. A revolution that happens among the workers mm -hmm. in this country is definitely going to have resonance for workers in China and workers in Russia who themselves are facing their own ruling classes. Mm -hmm. And so the question will become, can the, can the revolution that, take, that takes place in the United States, if it, if it did, mm -hmm. which I, I don't think it will start here, but yeah. let's say it did, or let's say it ha came to the United States and China and Russia hadn't, hadn't fallen in their own revolution, then it is a race against time about... Can can the will the Chinese ruling uh, work, workers take down their government? Mm -hmm. um, if they don't, if if they don't do that, and the U.S. working class is left isolated among among Europe, among mm -hmm. Russia, among China, then that revolution will not last. That revolution will find itself in the, in the situation that it found itself that the Russians found themselves in, which is an isolate. Now we will last way longer because the working class is much stronger. Um, the United States has more resources within it that the working class could use to sustain itself and to keep a uh, real working class democracy that means people are, are fed and, and housed. Um, because if you can't do that, you can't have working class democracy. Yeah. Um, and if that, you lose that, it turns out, I believe, you do lose the possibility of socialism. Yeah. Um, and if the revolution can be starved in, so that democracy is no longer sustainable, then the cap capitalists win. Um, and that will be the goal. But they'll be doing it simultaneously at the same time. They'll be, oh, good, we lost an enemy, but we've gained the, the possibility of revolution taking place in our country. And that's really what the United States faced when Russia went down. Mm -hmm. Russia and France were allies with, I mean, the United States and France were allies with Russia in World War I, fighting Germany and the other powers there. And suddenly, one of their powers went out of the game and went down. And then, that, and then Germany was not the big problem any longer then Russia became the big problem at that point. So the United States at that point was willing to kind of like put aside their problems with Germany and go after Russia and try to basically lead proxy wars to take down that government. Because they felt a bigger threat than even Germany was uh, the working class revolution that which had just taken place in Russia. And ultimately, the civil war that they helped provoke uh, uh, was successful in strangling the revolution, keeping it isolated, the revolution did not spread, nearly spread to Germany. We nearly had a revolution mm -hmm. in Germany. And had that happened, that could have been that domino effect, which the capitalists would worry about. Um, so that is the game. The game is, it's, it, does, international socialism will have to spread. If it doesn't, capitalism will, can re, regain itself. And I don't know if, if China 
feels like it has to nuke the, the, the newly formed workers' councils in, 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 um, in the United States, uh, or what was previously the United States, but now right. is the United Working Class of whatever. <laughs> um, but that's kind of beyond our control. The only thing we ultimately we can control is what we do in this country, and can we form, can we make a revolution happen that we would want to act as a light for other workers? Yeah. Um, uh, fighting those capitalists, taking the, the bomb out of their hand, I don't think we're going to be in a position to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, We're going to be counting on workers in China to do, do, to do, to do that themselves. Um, I mean, there, there's things that, there were things built like the, the, what's called the common turn, the Communist International, various parties forming to try to work together to try to spread the revolution. Um, but there were also actions the Rush, that the Soviet Union took to try to invade Poland in the 20s, to try to impose, you know, the revolution in that way. That, to me, that, that's, that's, you can't do it. That doesn't work, you know. I mean, this, at, at that point, it's a different type of revolution. It's not, right. you know, working, and, yeah. Yeah, and closer to what you do is what they did when they were fighting Russia, fought Germany, which is essentially give up territory. Mm -hmm. In the in making peace with Germany, to get out of World War One, and um, basically making that appeal to German workers, we're not willing to fight you. That's the only appeal we, the working class can make after its revolution. In my in my from my vantage point at least, um, is to say we're not going to fight you on any. We 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 refuse to fight other German workers, other Chinese workers, or other Russian workers, and we're making this appeal. To, for you to do the same and take down your government because they're going to force you to fight us. Uh, beyond that, I don't think there's much we can do. That's my answer. Yeah. All right. So, um, all right. I think we're done for today. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank Kenny. You, sir. Thank you. Um, for uh, being willing to meet um, and talk about Iran and socialism. Um, uh, next week, I think we'll be doing the episode with hopefully with Eduardo, and we're, and we're going to talk about the yellow vests. Um, maybe something will take place in the world that within a week. We we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Um, and if you've enjoyed this episode, then you uh, you can well you can see this episode on uh, yeah. iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, Google Play, Google, Google Play, yeah. BitChute. I should know this. I'm the person who <laughs> sets this up. Um, and if you've liked this episode or if you want to see other episodes, please subscribe um, or uh, review any of our episodes, you know, write a review for us on iTunes um, and certainly make comments if, for anything you've, you've uh, thought about when you, what you've listened to today. Um, Eduardo does such a much better job of ending it's the episode. Yeah. I mean, he's young. He's yeah, young. no, and he's uh, just, I mean, I can do some things, but this is Technology is not your yeah, first yeah. Um, but anyway, thank you for joining us. And um, anything else you want to say? No, I mean, I just hope that this is uh, starts conversations. You know, yeah. I think it's important to ask questions, and uh, you know, I'm happy that people have engaged around me yeah. for about this. Like, I don't have the answers, but by knowing the fundamentals of empire and power, capitalism, you kind of can, you know, put some of the pieces together and have a sense. At the very least, I would say don't take the news at face value. <laughs> right. And I would say that, that is why we want to do this episode, yeah. which is for, we are hoping people are having conversations like this to say, what the hell are we going to do to take yeah. back our world? Yeah. You know? And yeah, it is our world. Because and apparently the other people, these capitalists, are prepared to burn it. And you can beg them, yeah. you know. Yeah. All right. So uh, see you next week. And um, I guess that's it. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.